Germany's reluctance to commit her surface fleet to battle during World War I meant that she ended up forced to rely on other means of naval warfare. The use of converted merchant ships as raiders did achieve limited results, but the numerical advantage of the Royal Navy meant that those had largely been destroyed by 1915. Germany's answer was to declare the waters around Britain as a war zone, and she committed a submarine fleet to sink any ship they met without the need to offer any warning to the crews aboard. The policy was controversial. It was paused following the sinking of the Lusitania, but then later reinstated and extended out to international waters in 1917. The results were immediate. There were over 500 merchant ships sunk by U-boats in the first half of that year, with an average of almost 13 a day. The Admiralty's response was to form an anti-submarine task force, but with the likes of sonar and depth charges still being in their infancy, these efforts were largely ineffective. It was therefore decided to target the occupied naval bases on the Belgium coast, because that's where the German U-boats were using to access the English Channel. At 5am on the 12th of May 1917, three British monitors equipped with 15-inch guns took up firing positions off the Belgium coast near the port of Zeebrugge. For the next hour, assisted by naval aircraft acting as spotters, the three ships fired over 250 shells at the port's lock gates that led out into the sea and then withdrew. Unfortunately, because they've been operating at extreme range in order to avoid any return fire from the shore batteries, it was later found that they hadn't scored any direct hits. What was needed was something completely different in nature and the eventual operation that was settled upon combined two innovative proposals that had been put forward. The first of these elements was to land an amphibious force in the port, which would cause as much damage to the lock workings and the equipment there as possible before retiring. And the second was to take a number of old ships, sail them into the channel, and then sink them as blocking ships in order to make it impassable for U-boats and other craft. An amphibious force of Royal Marines, accompanied by several demolitions teams, will be landed on the harbour's mole in order to draw fire during the deployment of the block ships. They will be transported aboard an old cruiser, HMS Vindictive, which would have her main guns removed and replaced with mortars, howitzers and flamethrowers. The Vindictive will be accompanied by two converted passenger craft from the Mersey Ferry Crossing in Liverpool, named the Daffodil and the Iris II. These two civilian ships would have their hulls reinforced and would be similarly armed with a variety of close combat weapons. The ships chosen to be sunk within the port's main shipping channel were all Apollo-class cruisers that predated World War I, HMS Thetis, HMS Intrepid and HMS Iphigenia. All three had their lower decks filled out with concrete and demolition charges laid that would blow out the bottoms of their hulls and cause rapid sinking when triggered. Finally, two aging submarines, the C-1 and the C-3, would have their bows filled with explosives and they would be used in an effort to try and ram and destroy the viaduct which allowed access to the mole from the mainland. It took time to convert the ships identified for use in the operation and to find other ships to support them and defend against any counterattacks by the Germans. In total, 75 craft of varying size and purpose would end up being assembled and deployed as part of the raid. Preparing them and waiting for weather conditions for a calm sea and an effective smoke screen meant repeated delays to the operation. In the early hours of 23rd April 1918, the attack finally commenced and initially the 
Germans at Zeebrugge were caught by complete surprise. But almost immediately, things began to unravel. The wind changed direction and the smoke screen that was covering the attack dissipated. As a result, HMS Vindictive suffered repeated hits from German artillery and was eventually forced to land against the side of the mole, well away from her intended position. Similarly, the two Mersey ferries failed to make their landing sites and instead moored up alongside Vindictive, with their passengers scrambling up and through the battered cruiser in order to get ashore. As a result, the Marines on all three ships sustained heavy casualties before ultimately being forced to withdraw. Amidst this, it was discovered that the submarine C-1 had somehow slipped her toe whilst in transit across the channel and hadn't arrived. Aboard C-3, the steering system that should have allowed the skeleton crew who were operating her to set her to an autopilot function was also found to be malfunctioning. As a result, her captain was forced to sail the submarine directly up to the viaduct, set the charges manually and then abandon her. Shortly after this, the sub successfully detonated and completely destroyed the steel structure, which assisted the Marines as they were withdrawing. At this point, as the crews of the three block ships were attempting to steer into the mouth of the canal, they also came under fire. HMS Thetis was struck repeatedly uh, and veered off course, running aground. Her crew scuttled her uh, and then abandoned them just outside the entrance of the canal. Her two sister ships, however, pressed on through a hail of artillery fire coming from the shoreline until their commanders reached a point where they felt the channel was at its narrowest. Under intense enemy fire, efforts were made to steer the cruisers so that they were then sideways on to the channel. Demolition charges on both ships were then triggered before the crews abandoned ship to be picked up by motor launches that collected them and the crew of C3. A little over an hour after its arrival, the British force then withdrew, in total having lost 227 dead and over 300 wounded, as well as one of the escorting destroyers, which was sunk. In the aftermath of the raid, there was a big effort by the British government to frame it as a massive success. A total of eight Victoria Crosses were issued, including two Richard Sanford, who commanded C3, and Captain Alfred Carpenter of the Vindictive. The injuries sustained by the 4th Battalion Royal Marines were so great that the unit itself was disbanded. And as a mark of respect, uh, the Marines have never had a 4th Battalion race since. But in comparison to the high losses sustained by the attacking force, the defenders had in fact experienced few casualties. With the destruction of the viaduct, the Germans hadn't been able to deploy much in the way of manpower and ended up only sustaining 16 wounded and 8 dead. And although the three block ships did restrict access through the canal, the commanders had only partially angled them sideways at the point that the scuttling charges had gone off. During high tide, German U-boats were still able to pass by the wrecks and deploy, and there was no real impairment of their operations in the months that followed. True to form, the Royal Navy didn't learn a lot from the attack and made an identical attempt to block the port of Ostend on May 9th. During that attack, this time it was the turn of HMS Vindictive to be sunk, following her deployment at Zeebrugge the previous month. Again, there was a great effort made to play up the success of the, that raid, but through dredging around the wrecks, the Germans were again able to deploy submarines days after it had taken place. Despite its practical failures, the Zeebrugge raid did represent something of a propaganda victory for the British at a time where little else in the war seemed to be going well. It was creative in the manner it was planned and it was bold in the way it was executed and it would lay the basis for a far more successful operation during World War II. In the early hours of 28th March 1942, HMS Campbelltown was escorted and then rammed into the lock gates at the occupied French port of Saint-Nazaire. Several hours later, when the explosives inside her finally detonated, the port was rendered useless to the German Navy and would remain so for the rest of World War II.